Well, if you remember in our last message, uh, we actually began to delve into a little bit of apologetics, if you will, in regard to the divine nature of Jesus, the deistic nature of Yeshua. And, and what I did is I brought a couple passages to the table Passages that are utilized by anti-Trinitarians, by Arius-minded individuals that use these passages, passages to prove that Jesus is not God because he's created. He's a created being and therefore, by definition, Jesus can't be God. It's that simple. Today, we're going to press the issue further. I'm going to bring to you another passage that fits in this arena that our anti-Trinitarian friends uh, utilize a lot. And, I, you know, I've been debating this for over two decades now, uh, this specific topic. And I cannot tell you how many times that I have been confronted with this passage as evidence where people come to me and say, Daniel, it, you know, this, this whole conversation's moot. It's a moot point. Take a look at this particular passage. It makes it so clear that Yeshua was created so there's no even point get going any further in the discussion. And so we're going to look at this passage today. In fact, it requires such special attention. We're going to spend the majority of today just focused in on this passage. It is important that you follow me today. You know, I, I really don't like having to go to the Hebrew and going to the Greek. And, you know, some people roll their eyes. And when you get into that, but there are times where it becomes necessary. And today is one of them. And I don't want you to feel, if you don't know Hebrew, you don't know Greek, doesn't matter. I don't want you to get overwhelmed. I want you to track with me. Because if you follow me today, this is very simple message, really. And it may seem up here, at least on the surface, very deep or theological. It's not. It's very simple. Stay with me today. I need your attention because you need this. You need to be able to communicate this as you're talking to individuals about whether or not Jesus was created or he wasn't. And he, he falls into the realm of being deified, being God. So with that said, we're going to be looking at Proverbs chapter 8. And Proverbs chapter 8 is all about wisdom. From the beginning to the end, it's all about wisdom. And the interesting thing about this chapter is, is as you read about wisdom, wisdom is personified. It's a very interesting portrayal of wisdom. Now, before we get there, I want to lay a quick foundation. There's something that Paul says, and I've already quoted it several times, but there's something that he says that I want you to see it on the screen. And so before we get into this, this is going to help you. This is a foundation. Uh, and so let's open up with 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Mashiach, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Understand, Paul had this great revelation of who Yeshua really was. And one of the things he identified, he says he is wisdom, specifically the wisdom of God. Well, this is going to be very helpful as we jump into chapter 8. And what I'm going to do here, we don't have time to cover the whole chapter, but I'm going to cover enough for you to appreciate really the feel of what's being conveyed in chapter 8. And I want to provoke some thought before we get to the passage in question, before we get to the point of contention. And so I want to begin in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 17. And this is what we read. I love those who love me. This is wisdom speaking. Understand that. So you want to talk about personification. Wisdom is actually having a conversation right now. And wisdom is declaring, I love those who love me. Well, this is interesting because Yeshua says the exact same thing. He says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, oh, it is he who loves me. Now, just to kind of go back real quick to our Ten Commandments series, one of the things we talked about was the following. The Lord's love language. You know, for those of you who are married or are getting married, I'm going to tell you, you need to learn how to speak your spouse's love language. 
You want a good marriage? You want a happy marriage? This is what you need to do. The Lord's love language is for you to obey his commandments. That's his love language. And here, Yeshua, in the first person, this is important, and the first person says, he who has my commandments, and this is even going back into the Ten Commandments, it is he who loves me. But then it goes on and it says this, and he who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now think about this. I love those who love me. Yeshua just said, it is he who loves me. If you love me, you're keeping my commandments. I will love you. I mean, identical statement. And so this great, incredible mystery of Proverbs chapter 8, which Paul reveals completely, it is all about Yeshua. Yeshua is speaking. And so as we understand this, keep this in mind. We're reading about wisdom, but it is Yeshua speaking. Incredible revelation. Then it says this, and those who seek me diligently will find me. Now I want you to take this in because this is a God-only statement. That is a God-only statement. You can't go anywhere. Go, go through the Tanakh and try to find this statement where you know, Moses is walking around. Hey, hey, oh Israel, if you seek me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, you will find me. I don't see Elijah saying this. I don't see the kings of Israel saying this. I don't see King David saying it. I don't see the apostles saying this. This is a God-only statement. Every time we see this statement being made, it is explicitly God. Let me give you an example and just one. Deuteronomy 4.29. But from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. It's a God-only statement. I could show you times in the prophets where it does the exact same thing. Just last night with, with my family and doing devotions, uh, we're in Jeremiah 29, and Jeremiah 29, it literally says, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. You will find me. God only statement. Now here's where I'm going with all of this. Now it's time to provoke some thought. This statement, where it's wisdom talking, and wisdom saying, you're seeking me. Is that a different journey? Is this a different endeavor than this? Wisdom is talking. Wisdom is asking, you are to seek me. Are, are we to believe, well, that's something different than seeking God? These are rhetorical questions. You need to process this because it's not. They are one and the same. To seek Wisdom is to seek God. And let me tell you something. When you find wisdom, you find God. You find God. And who is wisdom? Yeshua. Dropping down to verse 29. When he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters would not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth. And this is wisdom speaking. I mean, we've got to stay on task here. And so wisdom is saying when he, the father, when he assigned the sea its limits, we're, we're getting into creation. Then, the wisdom, then wisdom says this. Then I was beside him as a wise master craftsman. Why does wisdom identify himself as a master craftsman? Because he created. We learned weeks ago that the Father made all things through Yeshua, creating heavens and the earth. All things were made through him and for him, whether in heaven or on earth or below the earth. All things. He is the wise master craftsman. And notice, I was beside him. Go back to John 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was what? Proston theon, with God. With God. Is, you know what, one of the most mind-blowing things, and I'm just going to share this with you briefly, most mind-blowing things about studying the word, that when you come into truth, what happens is you start going in other places like, oh my goodness, here it is also. 
Oh, oh my goodness, look at this. This confirms this. And you start going crazy. You start connecting all these dots. All these dots all were that were all over the place, you start connecting them. It's an amazing thing when you come into the reality of truth. And I'm telling you, that's how it is with this subject. It's absolutely mind-blowing. Now, it goes on. And I was daily his delight. We get a great revelation there. Yeshua is telling us, who is the wisdom of God, that he was the delight of the Father. Well, we can confirm that as you go to the, the New Testament. He says, oh, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Multiple times we read that. At his transfiguration, at his baptism. This is amazing. Rejoicing always before him. Rejoicing in his inhabited world. And my delight, this is wisdom saying this. My delight was with the sons of men. Listen to that. Because you want to get into a practical application of Yeshua's love for you. His delight was for you. That is an amazing revelation. So powerful. Verse 32. Now, therefore, listen to me, my children, for blessed are those who keep my ways. Understand, as you go through the Torah and even outside of the Torah, the ways of God are explicitly described as the commandments of God. The commandments of God. This is very important. But here, wisdom is saying, blessed are those who keep my ways. So wisdom is speaking in the first person. You're going to be blessed if you keep my ways. Again, let me ask the question. Is this a different way than God? Is the, are these different ways than the ways of God? Because this is wisdom speaking. And the answer is that's ridiculous. What's being described and can only be defined is the ways of God. The ways of God. And I think of Deuteronomy 26, or 11, 26. And I didn't put it up here, but it says, Behold, I set before you a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you keep the commandments of God and a curse if you do not keep the commandments of God. And so, and I quote that because this is God speak. This is speech that only God can make. And yet wisdom makes this speech. And we see God making this speech all over the place throughout the Torah and the prophets. And then we read this in John 14, 15. If you love me, Yeshua says in the first person, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth. Now take that in because this is going right back to the Ten Commandments. This is exactly what it says embedded in the Ten Commandments. Yet wisdom, or Yeshua, takes it in the first person. You need to keep his commandments. And what happens? You get the blessing. The spirit of truth is the blessing. There is no greater blessing that you'll receive ever than the spirit of truth because it is the proof of your inheritance. It's the proof of your salvation. I mean, this is very clearly laid out. You can read this Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's the seal. You're marked by God. This is a mark of God. And so here wisdom says, blessed are all those who keep my ways. And here you have wisdom saying the same thing, except wisdom is manifested in the flesh. And so all this to say is that when wisdom speaks, it's God speak. And you can't separate wisdom from God. You just cannot do it because wisdom is inherent into who God is. Verse 35, he who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. Read John 5. It is God, meaning the Father. I'm explicitly talking about the Father that gives life. And yet wisdom comes on the scene and says, if you find him, well, then you get life. And let's be clear. When it talks about life, it's talking about eternal life. It's not talking about, man, because you make some good decisions here, you're going to be successful. It's way beyond that. We're talking about eternal life. So if you find this wisdom, you have life. And isn't it interesting? Yeshua comes on the scene and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So what he says. And we continue. But he who sins against me wrongs his own soul. All those who hate me love 
death. Again, let me ask you, is this something different? Are we talking about something different? Because this is wisdom. Is that something different? To sin against wisdom, is that different than sinning against God? It's the identical same thing. You sin against wisdom, you sin against God. Period. If we're talking about the wisdom of God, if we're talking about God's wisdom, all throughout chapter 8, we're talking about God. The concept is inseparable. Why? Because wisdom and God are echad. Shema Israel, Adonai Lehinu, Adonai Echad. We have to have, you have to understand this perspective. You have to understand this relationship that is all over the place. This relationship is declared continuously through the scriptures. Absolutely amazing. I love what John says. He says, whoever denies the son does not have the father either. He who acknowledges the son has the father also. You want to reject God's wisdom? You'll never have God. You accept God's wisdom, i.e. the son, you will have the father. Because they're a chad. And so we get this over and over. And so I, I, I show you these passages. And, and like I said, we don't have time to go all through chapter 8, which is amazing. But I show these passages so that you have some deep perspective. You have some context to chapter 8. And kind of building up to now we're going to get to the crescendo. We're going to get to the passage of contention, if you will. In Proverbs 8.22, this is what we read. This is what all the fuss is over. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way before his works of old. There it is. This is what the anti-Trinitarians, this is what Arius based his ideology off of. This is a fundamental pillar of his ideology declaring Jesus was created. And you might look at this and say, Daniel, I'm not getting it. I, I don't see what you're saying. How does this make any sense at all? Well, let me highlight one particular word. All the contention is surrounding this one word. And it's interesting, this is the New King James Version. But when you go to other versions, it doesn't read this way. When you go to other versions, versions it reads this way. Created. Created. Now, read it like that. Yahweh created me. We know this is wisdom. You know what the beautiful thing is? is and I'll just say this. That, we, that, that foundation that, you know, that, that is out here is that whether you're an anti-Trinitarian, whether you stand in the camp of, I don't believe Jesus is God, but he's the Messiah, or you say, well, I believe Yeshua is God. Whatever side you fall, you know where there's not debate? It's over the fact that Proverbs chapter eight is all about Yeshua. There's no debate on that. There was no debate from Arius. In fact, his ideology depended that wisdom was based on Yeshua. And so we, we got that out of the... Uh, you know, out of the way, so to speak. And the only thing we're contending with, what does this really say about Yeshua? Some translate this term as created. Now, if you translate it as created, it totally changes everything. It's very different than possessed. And, you know, I could talk about the Good News Bible uses the term created, the Amplified Bible, the Net Bible uh, of course, the Jehovah's Witnesses, this is how they translate it. They use a different word, same thing as created, but they say produced. Uh, the traditional Jewish Orthodox translation, the JPS, uses the term created, which, you know, uh, no surprise there. There are translations that carry this term created. And so all this contention is arising over this. This is very significant. And this is one of those moments where we do need to go to the Hebrew. And we are going to go to the Hebrew because we got to dig into this and see what, what is going on here. And so let me put the word up here. The word is kana. Not to be confused with Elkanah, as in a jealous God. It's phonetically the same. It's spelled completely different. That's with an olive. This is with a hay. And what this means is, is kana means to get or acquire, to possess, to purchase or buy, to create, to set upright. 
You can see there's a, there's a, there's a spectrum here of how you could translate this term. And I'm just going to tell you, if, you've, if you study Hebrew and even if you study Greek, or any language for the map matter, certain words can have a very wide spectrum of translation. And how you decide when to translate it into the receptor language in a specific way? Context. Context. Now, this word, interestingly enough, in the Hebrew Bible is used over 80 times. Now, in the scope of things, that's not many because, you know, some words are found a couple thousand times. So 80 times over 39 books, that's how, that, you know, that's the total fullness that it's used. Now, I want to show you specifically how it's used. I want to get specific because this matters. Um, because I'm going to tell you there are only a handful of passages Remember, it's over 80 times we find this word and only a handful of passages that have a context that could even bear the English created, that could even bear that term. And even those could be debated. And so I want to take you through this. And this is going to come to us from the NASB uh, translation count. 58 times, almost 60 times it is translated this way. Bought by, buyer, buying, buys, purchase, purchaser, surely buy. Very pointed, very direct, very specific. Almost 60 of the 80 some times it's used is specifically in regard to buying or bought. Moving to the next classification, we discover 16 times it is translated as acquire, acquired, acquires, gain, acquisition, gain, get, gets, gotten. It's all the same. This is, okay, so here you have almost 60 times, 58 times and 16 times. uh, What are we at, 74? So 74 times out of just over 80 times that it's used, it is specifically used in the context of buying, acquiring. Now, if you even go to the English dictionary, you look up the word acquire, the first thing it says, to buy or obtain. In other words, what I'm telling you is these first two subgroups, which make up almost 90%, of how this word is translated, right, is to acquire. It's to buy. It's very specific. This is, you know, there are other Hebrew words, like I said, that have a a much more vast uh, usage, uh, a spectrum. Not this word. Very, very used, very specifically. But then we go to three times, we find it, it's translated as possessed or possessor. And then miscellaneous times, it says formed, owner, recover, redeemed, soul. So this gives you some perspective. I wanted to get you through this so you can see exactly how this term is being utilized uh, or being brought into the English, into this receptor language. Let me peel back another layer. When you go to the book of Proverbs, which Solomon authored this book, when you go to that book, you find in 11 verses, and I think it's 14 times this word is found. Now, it's only mentioned 80 some times. 14 of those times is in the book of Proverbs. Is that significant? That's very significant. And listen to me. Move aside our debated passage for a second. Move aside 822. Never once does Solomon utilize this term, kana, in a context that fits created, not once. And does that matter? It absolutely should. This is significant as, as we're going on this investigation because you can see that authors carry a DNA to their speech. They have speech patterns. They have writing patterns. There's a writing style. Every single one of you that sends out an email has a particular style. You have a particular train. Uh, you're, you're trained in speech and you don't even know it. There's certain... Uh, certain jargon that you like to use and that you're consistent. And so you can really see when you read the epistles of Paul, very, I mean, it's just so, it screams Paul. Very different than reading James. Okay? Very different than his writing. Luke's writing style, very different than Peter's. I mean, so, so there is a stamp here. Solomon has his style. 
No question about it. And he, he right at the head of the document is identified as the author. He has a particular style. What I want to do is this. I'm not going to take you through all 14. I'm going to give you a good eyeful of how Solomon uses this term. How cannot is found specifically in Proverbs. Check this out. Proverbs 4, 5. It says, get wisdom and get understanding. Kana. Is Solomon, is he moving at this as saying, create wisdom, create understanding. I'm not God. I wouldn't translate it that way. It's absurd. It's to get, it's to acquire. One could say, possess wisdom. All of these terms are completely legitimate to, to translate in the English from the Hebrew kana. Let me move on. He who gets wisdom, again, he who possesses wisdom or he who obtains or acquires wisdom loves his own soul. Proverbs 4, 7. We read this, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore what? Kana, get it, acquire it, acquire wisdom. And in all you're getting what? Get, kana, understanding, possess it, acquire it. This is, this is the way Solomon uses this term. I love this one, one of my favorite verses in Proverbs. Buy truth and do not sell it. Remember, almost 60 times it's utilized, it's translated as purchase or buy. But buying is to acquire. I mean, that's what it means. And so if I were to say, acquire the truth and don't sell it, it fits the context, even if I were to do that. Create the truth? That doesn't work. That doesn't work at all. Let me take this a step further. I want to take you to, and this, is, this gets interesting. I want to take you to, the, 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 this is the Jewish Bible, the JPS, uh, the Jewish Publication Society Bible. In their notes, specifically on Proverbs 8.22, in regard specifically to our word in question, they make interesting commentary. Check this out. Since ancient times, interpreters have disputed whether the verb kana means created or acquired. I want you to understand that he's in the realm of the Jewish arena. We're not, we're not getting into Christianity, okay? We're in the realms of Jewish. And he's saying as far back as you can go, the ancient rabbis debated, how should we translate this term? This has been the subject of great debate, specifically in Proverbs 8.22, especially when you consider all the other times Solomon uses this, let alone all the times it's found used in the Bible. Solomon never uses this in this context of created. Never. But listen to what it says next. The latter, meaning acquired, the latter allows for the possibility that wisdom existed from eternity and was coeval with God contemporaneous with God. What they're saying is, is if you translate this as acquired, it pushes wisdom back into eternity. Co-evil with God. It would be with God. Amazing. Amazing. Let's go back to Proverbs 8, 22. The Lord possessed me. Some people try to translate this as created. The translation is beautiful here. The Lord possessed me. Now, again, when you have a spectrum of how words need to be translated, context matters. It makes all the difference in the world. And considering what we just read from the Jewish scholars, recognizing, going to back to the ancient rabbis that debated, should this be, you know, should Kana say uh, created or should it say acquired? Knowing that the latter would push this into eternity. Well, if we translate it this way, can I support it? In the context itself, it said, the Lord possessed me. And then what does it say? At the beginning of his way, go back to the beginning of God. How far is that? Go back to the beginning of God. And that's where wisdom was. Do you understand why this would be translated appropriately? Whether you would say acquired or you would say possessed. Because this is pushing it into eternity. Even something that the Jewish rabbis, the, the scholars recognize. But that's what's being communicated here. Right? 
And again, just, just the thought that I shared with you in the last message. I just want you to think about this logically. Could there ever be a time that God existed without wisdom? The thought is insane. It's, it's, it's utterly ridiculous as though, okay, well, now God gets a thought somehow without wisdom. God gets a thought and says, now I want to create the heavens and the earth. And first I'm going to create wisdom and then I'll have the ability to create heaven and earth. You have to do so many bizarre gymnastics theologically to start doing this. And this is how you know. When you stumble across the devil and his absurdities, you, you, once you start digging further and further, it's like, that, that's insane. That doesn't even make sense. And here we are. But let me, let me build on this further. We're not done. To ensure that we understand what is being communicated, let me take you to the next verse. Check this out. It says, I, wisdom, have been established from everlasting, from the beginning, before there was ever an earth. I've been established. Now, is that Kana? It's not. That is not Kana. That is Nasach. Nasach. It means to be poured out. Now think about that. We learned in the previous verse, literally, that the Lord possessed me from eternity. Going back all the way from eternity, possessed me. The next thing that is said, this is fascinating, is that wisdom comes on the scene and says, I was established from eternity, from everlasting. I was poured out. Well, isn't this interesting? Because we learned something in the New Testament and then I say not even the New Testament, from the Old Testament, from pseudepigraphic work as well, that Yeshua was ordained before there ever was a world to be the sacrifice for all humanity, to save the people from their sins. Do you know, this is interesting, you, you can look it up yourself, Nasach, over and over and over and over and over and over again, do you know how it's used? Interesting. In a context of sacrifices, as in pouring out the drink offering. To pour out the drink offering on the sacrifices. This is talking about Yeshua. Let me share some passages with you. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. Just as he chose us in him, meaning wisdom, Yeshua. When? Before the foundation of the world. Nasach. He was poured out from everlasting before there ever was a world. Yeshua was ordained to save all of us. Let me take you to the book of Enoch, which if you're not familiar with the book of Enoch, this is a outside of the 66 book canon, but this was read by Yeshua's disciples. So much so, so much trusted by the disciples, it makes it into the New Testament in the book of Jude, literally being quoted verbatim as divinely inspired and drawn from multiple times, actually right in the book of Jude. Listen to what Enoch says. This is crazy. Wisdom is poured out like water. Wisdom. Notice the term that Enoch uses. Wisdom, nasach. He's poured out like water. He's poured out like water. Let me take it a step further and take you to Psalm 22. That psalm that begins, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabakathani, or in the Hebrew, Azavtani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a chapter all about the crucifixion, the sacrifice of our Lord. And this is what Yeshua says in that passage in Psalm 22. I am poured out like water. I am poured out like water. And so as we look at these two passages and we bring them together, the Lord possessed me, legitimate translation, the right translation at the beginning of his way, all into eternity. These two passages, this is a reiteration of, of verse 22. It's a direct reiteration. He's saying the same thing except for one little difference because the writer is adding to what he's already established. This is, this is absolutely amazing. When you look at this together, that the, that the wisdom existed all the way from eternity has been ordained from everlasting 
to be the savior of the world, to be poured out. This is what's being communicated, not that Yeshua was created. Not that he was created. That's, this, is, this is the sad state of affairs. But this is the devil. This is what the devil does. He wants to get in and destroy good theology, destroy true theology about the Son of God. Now that said, I want to bring another passage to the table. We're going to shift gears a little bit. And this is in the Gospel of John. And I actually want to begin in in verse 16. This is right after, the context here is right after the resurrection of Yeshua. All right? And so this this is what we read. Yeshua said to her, Miriam or Mary, she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Yeshua said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, oh, and to my God and your God. I wanted to start here. This is, this is the perfect place to start. Because this is where your anti-Trinitarians will come in and say, they look at you and, and they, they're left scratching their head going, how in the world can you for one second believe Jesus is God when Jesus himself calls the Father God? They see a massive disconnect here. They see a, a, a contradiction well, I, I, let me begin by saying, and you know, what I have to say in regard to this is going to go into next week. I am going to have to carry, there are a lot of things that I need to bring to the table about the relationship uh, between the Father and the Son that are very significant. But for today, I'm going to keep this short. There is no contradiction Because Yeshua stepped out and called the Father God because the Father is God. We're not debating that. Again, this is nice. I don't care what side you fall on. We're not debating whether the Father's God. It is crystal clear. Yeshua himself calls him God. And he does so legitimately. But hear me out. And this will be testified even on a greater level next week. There's no contradiction. There's no contradiction. The further we go into this, the Father is God. And Yeshua is God because he's God the Son. And the Father and the Son are a chad. It's not that hard to get to once you start to see the scriptures come together in perfect harmony. The scriptures can do this. No man can bring that together. It's the scriptures that will bring it together for you. But stay with me, you know? And, And let me remind you, we covered this. Did I put this up here? Yes. I found my clicker and we put Hebrews 1 8 up. We're good. But this is a passage we we talked about uh, just recently where it said, but to the son, he says, meaning the father speaking to the son, kisa ha Elohim, ha Elohim, okay? Your throne, oh God. You have the father calling the son God. I'm not, it's not a surprise that the son would call the father God. But to some, you're like, whoa. You have the father calling his son God. Elohim. And, and, and again, I'll, I'll reiterate the point. Well, some might be like, you know, well, Elohim is a very broad term, Daniel. It can, it's been used of demons. It's been used of Samuel. It's been used of the judges. It's been used of pagan gods. And so that doesn't work. None of that works because of the context. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness, a scepter of your kingdom. Your throne for all eternity Let me tell you, there's only one that has a throne for all eternity. It is the Lord himself. And so father is speaking to the son and saying, Elohim, calling him God. And then he goes on and says this, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Oh, therefore God, your God, Elohim, Elohim. So father uses the exact same term intentionally. You have Elohim talking to Elohim, right? That is crazy unless I understand the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And this is exactly what Yeshua just got done telling. I'm going to my Father and to your God and to my God. This is where I'm going. Well, this is exactly what we read. This is consistent. This is what I'm talking about. There has to be consistency all the way through. No contradiction. There is no contradiction. 
Now, continuing, verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Yeshua came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you, verse 20. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And, I, you know, I, I like John's commentary. They, they were glad when they saw their resurrected king. I mean, you want to talk about a, a breath of fresh air uh, after just watching the Romans, your enemies, your oppressors, take out your king. That, that can create a little bit of bitterness. And here they got to see the resurrected Lord. And what I have highlighted here where it says he showed them his hands and his side is very significant. This is significant. So Yeshua brought physical evidence. You know, when we talk about the resurrection, physical evidence was given. They literally could physically examine. That's empirical evidence. That's what they call that. Tangible. Dropping down to verse 24. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Yeshua came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And so the disciples shared with Thomas, we have empirical evidence. We literally saw, we have examined the physical evidence. We saw the prince in his hands. We know that he's been resurrected. We saw the hole in his side. And Thomas says, I don't care what you saw unless I personally, uh, uh, you know, review this physical evidence. I will not believe. I will not believe. And you know, and this is just a side note, but getting into, you know, the, the, the context going back and looking at Thomas. You know, I've always read this and I can feel Thomas's pain. He is so hurt that he truly believed. There's no question, there's nothing to say outside of this moment. He believed Yeshua was the king of Israel. He did ministry with Yeshua. In fact, we're told Thomas went out with the other disciples and what did they do? They cast out demons and they healed the sick. Thomas did things he never had the power to do before and he saw his king do things he's never seen before. And then to have your enemies destroy your king like that, that's post-traumatic stress. I mean, this guy is crushed. He is so crushed of what happened. He's like, no, I'm so hurt. This was the king. He was waiting for him to destroy Rome and it didn't happen to restore Israel. Verse 26, and after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them and Yeshua came and the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands, reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. He knew what Thomas had told the disciples. I will not believe unless I put my finger in the print of his hands and in his side. And that's the very thing Yeshua comes back and tells him. And then guess what? How does Thomas respond to this unbelievable thing where he already said, I will not believe unless I see him with my own hands. This is how he responds. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. This is a statement I'm going to tell you right now that can only mean one thing. It can only mean one thing. The construction of this verbiage, of the titles that, that he has brought to the table, these two terms of Lord and God coming together can mean nothing but the one true God of Israel. I'll put the Greek up here. Hakuriasmu kai hatheasmu. Now I'm going to tell you whether you get into the Hebrew, and in the Hebrew it would be Yahweh, Elohim. Whether you're in the Greek, it's kurios, theos. Or whether you're in the English, my Lord and my God. 
These two terms, when they intersect, when they are brought together, it is the most potent expression of the God of Israel there is. And this is throughout the Bible, as you go throughout the, the, the Tanakh. When these two terms come together, watch out. I want to give you an example, because John was written in Greek, and here we have hakuriasmu, kai hatheasmu. I want to show you kurios and theos being brought together. This will blow your mind, okay? Deuteronomy 17, check this out. And this is from the, this is the English of the Septuagint. For the Lord your God, he is God of the gods and the Lord of lords. Look at that statement. Who is the God of the gods and the Lord of the lords? It's none other than Hagar Kurios Hatheos Humon. Look at that. Kurios and Theos, specifically, these two titles being brought together can mean nothing but the one true God of Israel. Taking it a step further, Deuteronomy 28, verse 58. If you should not listen to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, to hear this honorable and wonderful name. What is this wonderful and honorable name? Well, in the English, the Lord your God. Oh, but in the Greek, it's kurianton theonsu. So this is literally kurios theos. His wonderful and honorable name. These two come together. Let me take you back to the Ten Commandments. One of my favorites. You will not bow down. This is the second commandment. Don't make any images. And you're not to bow down to them, nor will you worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. What is that? Again, there we are. Kurios hatheos. Kurios hatheos. He's the one mentioned. Again, these two terms coming Together And let me show you my favorite, the Shema. In the Shema, we have Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And what is the Lord our God in the Greek? Kurios hatheos. That's what it is. And so here's the deal. When we see Thomas coming to the table and saying, literally, hakuriasmu, kai hatheyasmu, have your mind blown to this Jew in the first century who knew very well what he was saying. He was compelled to proclaim Yeshua as God. Isn't that ironic? Because go back to 17, Yeshua says, I'm going to God. I'm going to my God. Legitimate statement. Jump to verse 28. Thomas is calling Yeshua God. Is there a contradiction? No, I hear the Shema. Hero Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. And it, just to make sure, you know, there are times where I could see Thomas losing his mind right now, right? You're in a situation that you're, you can't handle. I and mean, Peter was in one of these situations, right? In Matthew 16, uh, the transfiguration from 17. And, and Yeshua was transfigured before him. Peter lost it. He didn't know. He started babbling in a sense. He was like, okay, Lord, uh, I'll make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. He losing it. And it actually, the text actually says, because he didn't know what to say. Is that the situation? Because Thomas's mind is blown. If that were the case, I assure you, the next verse, Yeshua would say, don't say that of me. Yeshua would correct him on this level where you just brought kurios and theos together? Yahweh, Elohim together? No, 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 no. You, 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 don't, you don't walk away from that. But how does Yeshua respond? This is his response to this statement. Yeshua said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. <laughs> And what did Thomas believe? Hakuriasmu, kai hatheasmu, my Lord and my God. He believed the Messiah truly resurrected and he declared him to be God. Now that is what you call empirical evidence. He's literally tangibly looking face to face at the risen Lord. And this is the response. Amazing. And so we will close here today 
we will be picking this up. I have to give one more week to this. There's too much, there's too many loose ends that I want to tie together in regard to the relationship of the Lord. And I want to cover one more passage that is utilized very much so uh, from an anti-Trinitarian standpoint that is very much a stumbling block. And I want to go through that with you. And uh, with that said, uh, let's get to prayer.